This is an ABC podcast. Hello and welcome to The Health Report with me, Tegan Taylor. Today, the power of exercise for people with severe congenital heart disease. How often do cancer treatments actually improve quality of life? And is the future of personalised medicine in your body's fats and oils? But first, in the United States, a leaked Supreme Court draft opinion that threatens to overturn their landmark Roe v. Wade case has thrown abortion back into the spotlight. Here in Australia, abortion is legal. The last jurisdiction to decriminalise it was South Australia last year. But experts say that's not the same as it being accessible. And the people at greatest risk from unplanned pregnancy are often the ones least able to access it. Professor Kirsten Black is the chair of the Sexual and Reproductive Health Working Group within the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. And she joins us now. Hi, Kirsten. Good evening. How does abortion access vary across Australia? There is huge variation. We know that women, for example, in regional areas of Australia are 1.4 times more likely to have an unintended pregnancy but really struggle to find abortion care in their area. And at the moment, there's not many public hospitals across Australia providing comprehensive abortion care. So these women have to not only fork out the cost of a private service, which is around $400, but they also have to find money for travel and potentially accommodation. So what's driving the inequity? Is is there a lack of um, care providers or is there a lack of will? Yeah, look, I think that it's a combination of things. There's been very little hospital-based training in abortion care across Australia for many years, and my college has actually developed a training pathway in abortion care, but at the moment we don't have any places, uh, many places across the country to actually run it. So we have a real lack of, you know, providers, trained experts in medical and surgical abortion, but also there is just little public provision. So they come hand in hand, there's little public provision. So, you know, women who are the, the, the women who are most likely to experience an unintended pregnancy uh, are those from the poorest social determinants of health amongst those disproportionately face a myriad of economic education, work and social consequences due to unplanned pregnancy. These are the women that, are, that have the most difficulty accessing abortion and there's very little free public hospital abortion across the country. And it needs to be free because the people who need it don't have the resources necessarily. They don't have the resource. That's absolutely correct, yeah. So RANSCOG, the body that you're part of, frames abortion access as a health issue and says that access should be based on healthcare need and not things like geographic isolation and socioeconomic status. How much power do statements from peak bodies like that hold? I mean, I I, I think that it's important and that Ranscock has a leadership um, role in this field, certainly. But just the framing as a healthcare service, essential healthcare service is really important. And it's important to recognise that we provide free care to women experiencing a miscarriage, those seeking antenatal care, but not to those who choose, decide to not to continue a pregnancy. And yet one in four women in Australia will have an abortion in their reproductive lifetimes. So we need, you know, the the college and the practitioners, the members of the college, the obstetricians and gynaecologists actually support public hospital provision of services. But um, until now, you know, there's there's been the, the issue of the legal context, but as you said in your introduction, you know, abortion is now decriminalised. So I think it's really time to look at what services we are providing to our women across Australia and to increase access and training in public hospitals. The decriminalisation is relatively recent. You talked before about training pathways just sort of not existing for people to get skilled in this area. How long do you think it takes for a a a country or a state to scale up with something like this? So I think Victoria has done really well and they decriminalised, you know, more than 10 years before New South Wales and Queensland. And they have a really lovely kind of hub and spoke model where they have Melbourne, 
a you know a center for excellence which provides not only you know tertiary level care for abortion but also provides the support for practitioners in the community and in rural and regional areas for referral pathways and these this is just not a this is a model that we would like to see emulated in other states in Queensland, in New South Wales, and it provides, um, and, and Victoria's provided, you know, a good training centre. But that's unusual across the country. And so I think it takes uh, a, f a few years, it takes leadership in, in health to, to make these changes and to insist in, uh, on the area health services that they need to, to provide this essential service. And it is an essential service. You can think about it. It's not as acute as appendicitis, but abortion is time sensitive because the earlier an abortion is undertaken, the more options there are for the woman. She can choose between a medical or surgical abortion and also the lower risks of complications. And so if, if abortion is is integrated into teaching hospital services, it will also be more normalised as a healthcare issue and will destigmatise abortion, both for people seeking to access it and also for the healthcare professionals that provide the service. So we mentioned at the beginning the context for why we're talking about this partially is Roe versus Wade in the States. Are there implications in somewhere like Australia from that or is America just going to do its own thing and we're going to do our own thing here? I don't think there are implications necessarily in Australia, but I do think there are international implications because I think the overturn of Roe versus Wade would send a strong signal about the US's position on reproductive health care. And the international anti-choice movement and leaders in countries like Poland and Hungary that have increased restrictions to abortion access in recent years will feel empowered. And I think further, the United States Agency for International Development, USAID, is the world's largest family planning donor. And I think overturning Roe versus Wade could spur tightening of restrictions on USAID's ability to support the millions of people worldwide who need access to family planning services. So funding implications overseas. Uh, Kirsten, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Tegan. Bye. Professor Kirsten Black is an academic gynaecologist at the University of Sydney and practices at Royal Prince Alfred Hospital. Pretty much all of us have heard that there are different kinds of fat. There's differences between saturated and unsaturated fat in foods, and there are differences between so-called good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. But researchers at the Baker Institute are taking this fat-finding mission to a whole other level. I'm sorry I couldn't help myself. They run tests for about 800 different lipids, which are fats present in the body, to create a lipidomic profile where someone's metabolic health, which shows where someone's metabolic health is at and where it might be going. One of the researchers in this potential new avenue towards precision medicine is Peter Meikle, and Health Report producer Diane Dean spoke to him earlier about what lipids are and what they do in the body. They form the membrane of the cell. The membrane is made up primarily of lipids, but there's also lots of proteins that sit within that membrane. And so if you don't have the right lipid composition in your cell membrane, then a lot of these other proteins can't form their function correctly. The work that you're doing is called lipidomic profiling. What can it tell us about our health and why have lipids been chosen as the suitable factor for personalised medicine? We've chosen lipids because they are so central to life and so central to many cellular functions. They're also easily accessible in a sense that we can take a drop of blood and we can isolate the lipids from that drop of blood in the same way that we currently measure cholesterol or triglycerides from a blood sample, we can also measure many hundreds of different lipids in that same blood sample. Those lipids then reflect the lipids that are also occur within all of the cellular membranes. So we can get a readout, if you like, of the lipidome from that blood sample. The reason why this becomes very important in metabolic diseases, such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease, is that that readout gives us a measure of the metabolic health of the individual. Is their metabolism, and in particular their lipid metabolism, balanced, or is that in a healthy state? So it can tell us about their risk of developing different diseases. 
it's a way of getting ahead of a problem before any symptoms manifest to a greater degree. Where do lipids fall in the hierarchy of symptoms that you would watch out for? Lipids are really very early in that timeline. We call these diseases such as diabetes and cardiovascular disease, metabolic diseases. That metabolic dysfunction is reflected in that lipid profile that we measure. Typically, we can see these changes before the onset of disease. And that's the key, I think, to what we're trying to do is identify people at risk of developing disease before they actually develop that disease. Then the intervention can be relatively simple. It might be a lifestyle or a dietary change. It's easier, I think, to prevent the disease rather than to try and cure the disease. Is this part of personalised medicine or is it part of genomic profiling? It's a bit of both. We're pursuing this down two pathways. One is that pathway of personalised medicine where a doctor would refer a patient for a lipidomic screen and at the same time they might refer them for a genomic screen as well. And in fact, the lipidome and the genome give complementary information. Of course, the genome screen gives you genetic information, so that's your genetic predisposition to a disease, the genetic risk. The lipidome, of course, is influenced not just by your genetics, but the lipidome is influenced by your lifestyle and your diet and your environment, and all of those factors contribute to whether you have a dysregulation of lipid metabolism or dysfunction of lipids. By measuring both a genomic profile and a lipidomic profile, we feel we can get the best prediction of disease risk. There's another pathway that we're looking at that might be focused directly to the individual, so directly to the consumer, if you like, where we wouldn't necessarily be informing on disease risk, but we would be informing on metabolic health. We can use the same lipid profile to assess someone's metabolic health status. And there are a number of different ways that we're looking at that we can inform individuals about their metabolic health. One of those might be their metabolic age. Rather than calculating their chronological age, so someone might be 50 years old, as we age, our metabolism changes and we can use the lipid profile to measure those changes in metabolism associated with aging. And some people, of course, their metabolism will age faster than their chronological age, and others will age slower. And so they'll have a younger metabolism or an older metabolism, depending on the individual. And importantly, you can change your metabolism by adjusting your diet and lifestyle. People can really assess their metabolic health at any point in time, and then they can take appropriate measures to improve their metabolic health. Are they an effect on inflammation? Yeah, very much. The immune system or immune cells that are driving inflammation in many situations, they also have lipids making up the membranes of those cells. And those lipids respond to environmental stresses. So if you have high levels of oxidative stress, that can cause changes in the lipid membranes of the immune cells, and that can cause activation of the immune cells. And so different types of inflammation in different situations. We're looking at developing lipid signatures that would inform us of the inflammatory status of an individual. And that's important in a number of disease processes, so important to recognize that. And that's also important early on in a number of disease states. But of course, there's a lot of work involved in trying to interpret these very complex lipid profiles and how they relate to these different disease outcomes. We're developing these algorithms that will give an output. At the same time, we're working with cardiologists and clinicians to develop how those tests would be used. Obviously, if it's a clinical test and we're informing on patients' risk of disease, then in some situations that would require an intervention and that should be guided by clinicians. If we're just assessing an individual's health, that information then could be delivered directly to the individual. Knowing where they're going and whatever's happening, why it's happening. Yeah, and if they're not on a healthy trajectory, then giving them the information about how they can change that. Professor Peter Meikle is head of the (laughs) Metabolomics Laboratory at the Baker Heart and Diabetes Institute. If you're unlucky enough to be diagnosed with cancer, it seems like a no-brainer to expect that the treatment offered would either let you live longer or make your quality of life better, or ideally both. But research is showing that many cancer drugs don't necessarily improve quality of life. 
They might even make it worse and they might not do much for your life expectancy either. So why are they being approved and prescribed? A recent, pace, a recent paper in JAMA Oncology investigates just this, and I've been speaking to one of its authors, Bishal Gawali. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. So when we're looking at treating someone with cancer, we're really balancing their survival likelihood with their quality of life during the time that they're alive. What sort of factors play into this balance? Yeah, patients with cancer, they take drugs, assuming that taking those drugs helps them live a longer and a better life, ideally both. But some of the cancer drugs, they do only either of them. And most cancer drugs, recently, they do neither of them. Why on earth are we giving people drugs that don't do either of those things? That's a question that we as a society need to ask nowadays, because most of the drugs that are approved lately are approved on the basis of what we call surrogate endpoints. What I'm trying to say is these drugs are approved because they shrink tumor on CAT scans. But what we have seen is shrinking the tumor from 5 centimeter to 2 centimeter does not necessarily mean that the patient will have a longer life or a better life in most cases. There are some exceptions, but that's the crux of the problem. So what did you look at in your recent study? We're trying to look at the phase 3 randomized trials of cancer drugs and we tried to see what happens to the quality of life outcomes for our patients in these trials. And the reason for that is most of the cancer drugs, they get approved on the basis of survival or these surrogate endpoints like responses or progression for survival. But most cancer drug trials, they do not even look for quality of life outcomes until recently. There has been some improvement, but we wanted to see what the quality of life outcomes are with modern cancer drug trials. Still, quality of life outcomes is not measured by a huge number of trials. Of those that do measure, we found that only 24%, so one quarter of these trials, actually improved quality of life. Some of our cancer drugs, despite shrinking the tumor or despite delaying progression, they do not improve quality of life. So we wanted to check this quality of life outcomes with the survival outcomes. And one reassuring finding is that of the cancer drugs that improved survival, none of them actually worsened quality of life, which was a meaningful finding. But of those drugs that did not improve survival, only delayed the growth of the tumor, some of them were associated with worsening of quality of life. That is an important finding. We have cancer drugs that do not improve how long a patient lives, just delays the growth of the tumor or maybe shrinks the tumor, but ends up worsening patient's quality of life. So I would argue that these drugs are harmful for patients, harmful for society. And the third finding was that even when the quality of life was detrimental, when this was reported in a publication, in the trial publication, there were a lot of bias in how the authors framed the quality of life outcomes. We call it favorable framing of quality of life results in our paper. I want to give an example. If the quality of life was worsened, some of the studies reported it by saying quality of life was worsened only slightly probably this is not of importance. So they were trying to downplay the detrimental effects on quality of life. If there is an improvement in survival or quality of life, they never do that. They never say that, oh, we improved quality of life or we improved survival, but it was only a small margin, so it's not meaningful. They never say that, but when the direction is opposite, they try to downplay it. And the other example is when quality of life was not improved, instead of reporting it as the drug did not improve quality of life, they write the drug did not worsen quality of life. No patient is taking a drug expecting to not worsen their quality of life. They want their quality of life to improve. These are some of the nuances in which uh, reporting can bias the readers towards a more favorable interpretation of the drug than it actually is. Do we need a standardized measure for quality of life or does this need to be compulsory as part of how results are reported? We should mandate that all cancer drug trials should report quality of life. At least the phase three cancer drug trials that are seeking registration and approval of the drug they should mandatorily report on quality of life outcomes, A. And B, if the quality of life is detrimental and survival is also not improved, then we should classify those drugs as harmful and not worthy of approval. And third, the journals and the editors and the reviewers should be 
aware of this potential bias in framing the results during publication so that we can avoid this in our trial publications. So how is quality of life measured usually? Is it self-reported or are there certain measures that are taken into consideration? Yes, quality of life uh, measurement is a little messy. It's not as straightforward as measuring survival because survival is pretty straightforward when a person dies. That's a fixed date. But quality of life is usually self-reported, but there are several tools to measure quality of life. The important thing is that we need to use a validated measure. What do you hope comes of this research in terms of patients? When you are in a clinic and your oncologist is recommending you a certain drug, you need to ask, does this drug improve my quality of life? And not just assume that because the progression will be delayed, quality of life will be improved, and that cannot be assumed. In fact, we had several drugs that worsened quality of life despite delaying progression. And the other thing actually is, in our study, we saw that among those drugs that worsen quality of life, most common were targeted drugs. In modern oncology practice, we have started to become a big fan of targeted drugs. But our study actually questions that notion. Simply because a drug is targeted does not necessarily mean that it will lead to better quality of life compared to chemotherapy. So patients will need to ask specifically what the consequences on their quality of life will be as a result of taking that drug. And the physicians will also need to answer that question. So they will be seeking for more evidence on this issue than the trials and the, and the industry will need to provide those answers. So that's how maybe we can make some cultural changes. Bishal, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much. Dr. Bishal Gawali is in the Cancer Research Institute at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada. You're listening to RN's Health Report with me, Tegan Taylor. Heart defects at birth are more common than you might expect. About 1 in 100 babies is born with some kind of heart defect. Most of these are small holes that are patched, but at the extreme end of this spectrum are problems that require surgeries that effectively leave them with half a heart. That little heart's job is to pump the red oxygenated blood around their body and the blue blood that needs oxygen is sent straight to the lungs without the help of a pumping chamber. It's a surgery that saves lives, but it comes with limitations. And understandably, kids who have had this surgery are often wrapped in cotton wool, told not to exert themselves too much. But a new research project is turning this on its head and looking to exercise as a key to improving life expectancy and importantly, as we just heard, quality of life for people with half a heart. Cardiologist Rachel Cordina is behind this study and she joins us now. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Tegan. Thanks for having me. So why are you looking at exercise for a group of people that seem intuitively, intuitively at risk of overexerting themselves? Well, um, you're absolutely, you know, a- along the lines of what generations of doctors and families have thought that, you know, we probably it might be dangerous to increase heart output. But um, when I was doing my PhD research a few years ago, I became really interested in the idea of the peripheral muscle pump that might be able to take the place for the leg pump. There was really interesting research from NASA in the 80s that showed that more muscly astronauts didn't lose consciousness falling through the sky because their muscles helped push blood return up to the heart. And so we intensively resistance trained a group of people who have this special circulation called a Fontan circulation and showed that by building up their muscles, it takes the place of the heart pump and helps push blood back up through the lungs and improves their circulation, improves their cardiac output and also improves quality of life as we've you know just been talking about. Right. So the muscles of your body are basically acting as that other part of your heart that would usually be pumping the blood around. So right, what does even, the try? <laughs> Go, yeah, sorry. What are you going to say? No, Go for it. I was just going to say, and even you and I, our muscle pump's important. So when we, when we start exercising, 20% of our blood return is pushed up from our leg muscles. So this is a new trial that's only just beginning. What does it involve and what are you sort of building on in terms of previous research? So the trial that we did years ago was really a tiny study and it was very onerous. It required people to come into a gym in Balmain with me hands-on training them three nights a week. So they all had to live close by. This study is uh, studying people all across the country and we're going out to them. So we're training trainers who come out to them in their local communities and train them in gyms for kids in local school halls 
in school halls. And then we're also trialling a telehealth training model as well, where we send people lightweight exercise equipment that they can use at home. So you mentioned kids just then. This is a surgery that's done really early in life. So presumably people are doing or need interventions quite early. How do you do a structured exercise program with a toddler? Yes, great question. So most kids these days have their surgery at around four years of age. And really the, the key in little children is games and families. And we're more and more recognising that it all comes down to family behaviours and family habits. And if the parents sit on the couch watching TV, it's very unlikely that their child's going to become really athletic and active. So we're also trying to get families involved and, and teach them how to all lead active lives so those habits are laid really early. And, and for little children, it's much more about fun and being active and messing around in groups rather than a structured exercise program. So again, this is early days with this trial, but what is the life expectancy generally of people who've had this procedure and what kind of a change are you hoping to make with this structured exercise program? So people living with half a heart have the shortest survival of, of most other types of complex congenital heart diseases. However, being able to perform this surgery was really a game changer. And there's a generation of people now, we started doing the operation in the 1970s. And those first surgeries, the outcomes weren't as good as they are now. And, and most people living with this circulation can hope to live into middle age, but there is a high rate of death and transplantation, sadly. And to date, there's, n there's really no uh, non-invasive effective therapies. Pe we've tried all sorts of different drugs. Nothing's been shown to be effective. And looking back through all the science in the past couple of decades, the most effective therapy to improve this circulation is not a drug, it's exercise. And it was our resistance training, strength training project. And we improved peak exercise capacity by 10%. So we really need to get in there from early in life and, and start implementing these therapies as early as we can and teach people who are scared and whose families are scared and who've often been told not to do anything, how, how to fulfil their potential and optimise their circulation as much as we can. How long will the trial go for? When do you expect to have results? We're training people for a year, but it's a really massive trial across the country. So we'll probably be finishing up in three to four years' time. Right. So this is really looking at long-term effects or long-ish term yep. effects of this intervention. That's right. We, we really need to understand what the long-term adaptations are. We don't just want to do an intervention and you know study it after a couple of months and then say goodbye to everybody. We're training people how to train themselves and then we're following them for a whole year. How many people in Australia would fit uh, into this category? So there's around um, 1,600 people living across Australia and New Zealand living with this condition at the moment. And in Australia, we have a, a registry uh, that, that I chair, and it's the largest of its kind in the world. And it's really helped us to be world leaders in how to care for these people. It's been really a game changer being able to, it's a relatively rare population. And, and here we are leading the world. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you, Tegan. Associate Professor Rachel Cordina is a cardiologist with the Heart Research Institute in Sydney. And that's it for the Health Report this week. Norman and I will be back with you again next week. You've been listening to an ABC podcast. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.